Okay, well, welcome everybody to the Financial Freedom Classroom for January 29th, 2015. Before we go, we would just like to remind you that we are not licensed financial advisors, accountants, lawyers, or tax preparers. Therefore, the information on this presentation is no substitute for legal, financial, or accounting, or tax advice. Also, keep in mind that everybody has different objectives, and the information is meant for general purposes only, and always check with a qualified professional for your specific needs. And so we are the Financial Freedom Classroom. It's comprised of myself and my husband, John, and we're owners of Lock in Your Success, LLC, and we do stock options trading, coaching, and education. And as you can see, we've had some um, successful businesses as well, and we are active real estate investors and we provide loans and guidance to small businesses. So we're involved in many aspects of... Yes, we do a whole lot of things. Yes. So tonight we're gonna to talk about phases to freedom. And we have developed some, um, some phases, but what we wanna talk about first is what is financial freedom? So we've, we've kinda of come to the conclusion that it's really different for each person because of people's different situations, their perceptions, and it's important for each person to define what that means for them. Right. I mean, one of the things that happens is I tend to talk to a lot of people about financial stuff. And, you know, what I find is is a, a lot of people, I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll find somebody who makes three, tri, triple, triple digit figures or six figures. And, you know, they'll be, pay, they'll be living paycheck to paycheck. They'll have uh, very high debt, very little savings. Uh, and then you'll turn around and you talk to somebody who makes maybe in the $50,000 range, has a family, and they've been responsible with their money, they saved, and when you take, start looking at this situation, they're actually very, very well off. Right, so, and they're very comfortable, um, and, it's probably, and chances are it's because they've managed their expenses really well. Um, so why should you strive for financial freedom? Uh, one of the reasons is, is, in, it, I'm sure you've seen it in the news and so forth, but financial matters are a major stressor in many people's lives. They cause health problems, they cause families to break up, um, and really we wanted to develop some kind of system so that people can work together to achieve their goals and their dreams through financial freedom. Right, and we kind of wanted to start at the beginning. So if you're already past a lot of these phases, don't worry about it. Uh, you good for be, you. Congratulations. You may be on phase five. You may be on phase five. <laughs> you might be all set. Uh, some of you may not even, you know, you may be in a real sad situation. So let's just kind of go through everything and, and we'll go from there. So here are the steps that we, were, we had. Right. So our phases are um, always watch your nets, starters, debt destroyer, self first, then the kids, put your money to work. So they sound a little unconventional, but uh, they are hopefully somewhat descriptive. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, we can start with always watch your nets. So we want you to know where you are. You should always know where you are. So that includes you want to know your net income, you want to know your net, uh, your net worth, certainly, and then you want to watch what those total expenses are. Yeah, I mean, pretty much no matter what you what you do, if you're in your car and you want to get somewhere and you're going to plug something into the GPS, the GPS needs to know two things. It needs to know where you are and it needs to know where you want to go. So this is the know where you are phase. You'd be surprised the amount of people that I actually talk to who have no idea what their net worth is, nor do they even know what net worth is at all. Um, they think, you know, if they have a house in that's worth $100,000 and they owe $100,000 that they have uh, a net worth of $100,000. But the reality is if that's the case, you have a net worth of zero in regard to your house. So. Right. <laughs> right, and that's not a good situation to be in. So um, we do, I mean, obviously the golden rule here is to spend less than you earn. So we do have... Right, we want to create a success loop of that too. So and part of that is going to be knowing your net worth, knowing what your net income is or your income after taxes, right. and then your total expenses. And we always want to make sure our expenses are less than what we earn. And if we do that month after month, we're going to start adding to our net worth, which is going to create a larger and larger net worth. Unfortunately, a lot of people go backwards. <laughs> they don't know their net worth. They don't really know their income after taxes. They just spend money. Their total expenses 
are bigger than their net income and their net worth goes down and down and even to the negative numbers. Right, so, and, and that's really where that whole major stressor comes in. If you don't know these things, if, if you don't know, then a lot of times you feel out of control and that can cause a lot of different problems. So you want to definitely know where you are and then another part of this is where you want to go. So it's still the same formula. You still want to know and always know your net worth, your net income, and your total expenses. And if you track this, especially on a monthly basis, I think that you'll see you want to watch it and make sure that your net worth is going up. Well, yeah, right. This, is, this has everything to do with setting goals right? and goal setting. So that's probably another a good subject for a future meeting, actually, is, is kind of go into goal setting and stuff like that. I know some people think it's beaten to death, but we have a unique uh, approach to that. Uh, but the thing is, if you don't know where you want to go, then you're going to tend to just keep your net income and total expenses the same all the time. And if you set these goals that uh, you want to save a certain amount of money for a certain thing or all this other stuff, then what you'll do is you'll actually consciously or unconsciously lower your expenses so that you can grow your net worth so you can buy whatever you want to buy. Right, and you want to measure this. So... What we did come up with, we do have a couple of worksheets that we did come up with, and if we can get them up on the computer. Yeah, let me, get, let, me get those. Than, let me get those for you. John's handier than I What do you want to do, the net worth calculator? Well, here's the net worth calculator that we came up with, and uh, we put quite a bit of things in there, and obviously your assets are on your left-hand side, and then your, li your liabilities are on your right-hand side. So, and then they'll total them up, and then you'll have your net worth. If you can see right up at the top, it would calculate your total net worth up there. And then uh, I, we added a debt ratio, too, just so that you could see what your debt ratio is. So what's the importance of the debt ratio? Well, you want to make sure that it's as low as possible. As low as possible? <laughs> okay, so we want to make sure that comes out as low as possible. Your debt Hopefully to, it's zero. Your debt to asset, right? And, and that would be zero. That Hopefully would be this zero. one is not zero, right? and this one is zero. Right. <laughs> That's what we want to try and uh, strive for. And, um, yeah, so this is great. Right, and so we had, obviously, in this you're going to consider your cash, your investments, your real estate, uh, your businesses, and so forth, and then we want to watch those debts and hopefully eliminate all of those. So it would be really great if that left-hand side was just all zeros. Right, and you did have another sheet too, right? Yep, I we'll have a monthly spending plan worksheet as well. I've tweaked this a little bit because I was using it before, but I've added quite a bit of other categories and put other in there for people to um, to put that in there. So, so you can customize it to yourself. You can, um, and there's a bunch of income blocks there. So, I mean, if you're retired and you collect Social Security, so that's in there. So you can really look at all your various right. income and think about maybe adding more. Right. And we've been, uh, you know, if you want these, you can, they're going to get up on our website, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, soon, if they're not up there already. And, you know, if you have a category or something you'd like to see, of course, you can change these on your own. But if it's someone that, something that should obviously be there, like we didn't have mortgage in there. Um, and we're, we don't have a mortgage. We're continually working on this, but we don't have the mortgages, so uh, we just weren't even thinking of that. And uh, I know it's a no-brainer, but hey, right. you know, we all live in, have a different map of the world, they say. Uh, but yeah, so if you see something there, you can... You can so uh, there's quite a few categories if you just want to scroll down a little bit. So um, housing, utilities, food, auto, uh, insurance and health, and personal, and then recreation, and then the yucky category, which is debts. So... We really don't want anything there, but um, you know it, it is. It, it's a fact of life, and a lot of people. Well, we all know, start so. some, somewhere, and, right. and we've had, believe me, in our lives, yep. we've had plenty of do this, to do this. Right. All right. So we just got a question from Francois. Um, if someone is a co-signer on a child student loan, should that be counted as a liability, even though the debt belongs to the child? Actually, well, if you're a cosigner, the debt does belong, not belong right, to the child. It belongs to you. Yeah. It, it, so, yes. It might be an agreement between you and the child, but if it comes down to it, that debt belongs to you. It's going to affect your credit just as much as his. Right. And they're going to come after you for it, actually, because you're the one with the money. So, Unfortunately. Um, Sorry. Yeah, that is definitely. So, yeah, that would be yours. That is definitely a, a debt that's technically yours. Yeah. yeah. Um, of course, you know, if you have a deal with the child to, to pay it off, then... You know, you, obviously you have him pay it off, right? and it's his responsibility. That's the way that it goes, but technically it is yours. Right, so, exactly. Um, 
So, I, would, I wouldn't pay it off for him if the agreement was that the child was going to pay it off. I would definitely let the child pay it off. Right. But if you're in a situation where it's going to affect, it would affect your credit if he didn't, you have to. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely have <laughs> so, to. It's a gift. <laughs> All right. right. Okay, so we'll get back to the slides. Um, and so that just, if it's worth measuring, it's worth, uh, if it's worth doing, it's worth measuring. So just right. Keep, and you'd always keep doing that. Of course. That wouldn't course. stop. And and then, so, we, then we have this thing called starters, which is, a, this is for somebody who doesn't have an emergency fund yet. Um, and we always, always, you know, say you have a, a whole bunch of bills and you just don't have enough money to put in the emergency fund. The emergency fund is actually more important than the bills, uh, unless it's a, unless it's buying food uh, or your or your mortgage. That's that's got to come first because you have to have a place to eat. You have to play a place to live. You have to have a, uh, food to eat. Uh, when I mean, in New Hampshire, you have to have heat or you'll freeze to death. Uh, <laughs> Minus thirteen this morning. Minus thirteen this morning. Yeah, nice and uh, <laughs> nice chilly morning, brisk. And, uh, you know, other than that, you know, credit cards can wait, other things can wait, get your emergency fund built up so that you, I mean, not a big emergency fund, just some sort of a, to a, start. a quick little, maybe two weeks of pay if hopefully you're working. Right. And, uh, you know, $1,000 yeah. if it's greater. And, of course, we always recommend if you have an employer with matching funds, that's an automatic raise. So. Well, it's a 50% return plus interest. So it's definitely worth doing before you start to attract the debts. Um, it's really important. And really, the starter emergency fund is so that you don't go deeper into debt. So mm -hmm. it's it's a real important thing to get started and to maintain it at that level. So the golden rule is to be prepared. Be prepared. All right. Debt destroyer. This is really... This was John wanted it to say debt destroyer. Debt destroyer. That's right. I hate debt. <laughs> I was a, when I was young, I had debt. It's, I remember <laughs> buying a humongous, I never forget that humongous stereo system, the entertainment system that you bought, that it was the size of your room. It was humongous, and I took out a personal loan for that. Yes, we did. We ah. showed you a personal loan for that. I had like four cars because I, <laughs> I was an auto mechanic. I loved Car, a race car, and a truck. I had a luxury car, a sports car, and I was like, I don't know, twenty. <laughs> Just a little bit of debt there. Yeah, I had some debt go on. <laughs> so what we want to say here is, we really want to eliminate your debt. Now, you can start with the smallest one. Some people like to start with the smallest one to see progress. Some people like to start with the highest interest rate. Um, you know, it's probably whatever you decide to attack first. Whatever's going to motivate right. you. If it motivates you to pay off a small debt and then and you're, you're good to go, then that's right. awesome. I mean, Paul, obviously financially is better off if you pay off the high interest one. Right. However, if it's not, if you're not going to pay anything off, it doesn't do you any good. So I'd rather see you paying off something and getting uh, a little bit of steam behind you and get rolling right. than, uh, and pay off the highest interest one because that's what's most important is getting into the habit of getting your loans down. Right. And and so in order to do this, what you would really do is you would want to focus on whatever that debt is that you want to attack first and pay minimums on everything else and whatever else you have, you want to attack the thing with a vengeance like a cooler. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you want to, yeah, I mean, you just, gotta have, you just need to, to uh, I mean, if you're in a lot of debt and you've been irresponsible in the past, then you're going to have to pay for right. that, and that means just not uh, getting a lot of the things that you want for now uh, and getting that stuff paid off, because right. realistically, if you're buying stuff and you're in debt, you can't afford it. Right. You actually have no business doing it, so, right. uh, so you want to do that, and, you know, we do rec tend to recommend paying off a mortgage and I mean, not to kill yourself necessarily to pay right. off the mortgage. Kill yourself to pay off your auto loans, your personal loans, your student loans, right. credit cards. But um, mortgage. It's an appreciating asset. It's so. an appre I mean, would I prefer to get it paid off? Yes. Uh, Sherry is very firm with that to pay it off. I also well, it feels really good not to have one. Yeah. So I want everybody, to, <laughs> everybody to feel that. But, you know, another thing to consider about a mortgage is, they're not all created equal, so you really, really want a fixed rate mortgage, and it would need to be a low interest rate. You do not want the variable kind. Um, yeah, even though variable is lower than oh, a fixed, yeah. you know, it, yeah. it is a little bit fixed. The thing is, I mean, if you can, I, you know, 
we have just such a wide, diverse amount of clients and people who listen. I mean, some people, they'll have like, I don't know, two million dollars in cash and they'll, and they'll have uh, a real estate loan for five hundred thousand dollars that they could pay off any day they, they happen to want to and for whatever reason they want to keep the mortgage because it's a low interest rate well you know that's fine you can afford it if you want to pay the bank money for no reason then, then that's up to you um, you know if you want you know maybe give me the mortgage you know I'll give you some money to pay me some, some money for no reason I don't know but but um, yeah, I mean, if that's your, if that's your case, that's fine. But if you're you know the average guy that has a mortgage and and uh, struggling to pay it off, you know, just just get it over with, get it paid off as, as quickly as possible. Right. Yeah. And a general rule is get it down at least fifty percent um, as quickly as possible. In that way, if something some emergency right. were to happen or some the drop in the market or whatever you generally will be okay it's kind of an insurance policy right you definitely want if you have your house 100 percent mortgage 80 percent mm -hmm. mortgage you definitely want to get that down to 50 percent as quickly as possible right. like i said we saw it in 2008 mortgage mm -hmm. property value is cut in half and you know for people who had 50 percent mortgages they could get out of the things right if they uh, if they wanted to uh, if they lost their jobs right uh, these guys with 180 percent, 90 percent, 125 percent mortgages, they just they they lost their house, they lost their credit, they lost uh, a whole bunch of stuff. So right. I, I hate to see that. Hate to see that. Right. So the golden rule is do not add more debt. So right. Right. Of course, draw a line in the sand. Right. And, and, and you know, if you're if you have a business or something, and you have you know, sometimes you need debt in it within a business and so forth, but, and that's okay. That's a different that's, story. Yeah, we're talking about different. personal debt. Right. So in phase four, we're going to talk about sell first. And right, everybody, everybody asks us, who should you take care of first? Right. Should you take care of yourself or, you know, hey, my kid, my, you know, should I be saving for my, col my kid's college or should I be saving for my retirement? What should I be doing? Well, unfortunately, we've heard situations where people have drained their retirement to the point and they gave it to their children to go to school but what happens then is is that when you start to go look towards retirement you're not going anywhere you're going to be working until your dying day and god forbid you have an emergency or something happen and you can't work um it's just not a good it's just not a good way to be so Let's here we it, say that kid's not going to pay you back I know. <laughs> he might you, he might but chances yeah. are he's not so you have to kind of figure that in right so we just said if you don't take care of yourself you can't take care of anyone else which is true so what you really want to do is the ne your next step after all your debts are paid off is to maintain six months worth of your household expenses right build a real emergency fund right and you want right. to make sure you maintain that so if you have an emergency and you have drained it a little bit you need to make sure that you put it back so that you have a full six months worth of expenses just to just to weather those right forms. and this is too when we do our budget or our spending plan we want to make sure that we have uh, you put away money month on a monthly basis for large expenses like because when we say a six month worth of emergency emergency fund that emergency fund isn't to purchase your next new car right. it's not to put the roof on your house necessarily uh, but it's it's for something that's a surprise you know realistically if you own a home you know it needs a roof every 15 20 years you own a car you know you got to replace it every so many years um, and whatever and pretty much everything in your life if you really think about it you know increments when that stuff needs to be replaced. So most, for the most part, that stuff should be built into your budget. The reality spending is, plan. yeah, it was spending plan. Thank you. Uh, for the most part, you really shouldn't be touching that emergency fund. It's it's when something very unexpected happens, a, a job loss, a uh, health emergency, right. uh, things like that. Right. So, right. So that that's what that's what the emergency fund's for. It's not to replace your cars. That should be in, in your spending plan. Right. Exactly. Right. So the next part to this is that you're going to invest a full 15% of gross income into a retirement account. And that's just going to happen automatically. If you can set it up so that it happens automatically, that's the best way to do it. Um, set it and forget it. So uh, that would be your next step. Right. And if you don't have a house, you should be paying or you should be saving 
to purchase a house for a down right. payment. Yeah. Well, well no, that's not okay, true. We, we've talked about this because right. in some cases, some cases that wouldn't be people true. aren't going to buy. So they may, if they're in the military, if they, you know, travel from here to there and don't have, don't want to put down roots somewhere, then this isn't for them. But if you want to own a home, you want to have at least 20% down. I would suggest, though, if you're not going to own a home, that you have extra money put aside so that you, because if you own a home, you figure you buy a house when you're, I don't know, 30 or whatever, and theoretically, if you're not using it as a bank, which we definitely say we don't want to use our <laughs> house as a bank, uh, if you're not using it as a bank, by the time you're 50, 60, you should be paid off, and you have this really big asset, right? When we have, when we don't have a house, we don't have that asset. So it makes sense to have some extra cash, uh, whether it be in investments or or in some sort of an investment, to to deal with that. So, I mean, that's just my take on that. I don't know how you think about that. Yeah, no, I I, I mean, it, any extra cash is good. <laughs> I mean, it's not extra, extra cash is good. That's right. So um, certainly, but but after yourself and after you've taken care of all of these yeah. large expenses, if you so choose. Then the kids. Right. Then it's time for, yeah, maybe a college fund. Right. right. If you can't fund your, your retirement 15% a year, right. then you can't afford a college fund. And right. the kids got to deal with this college. Right. Uh, it's not necessarily your responsibility. I know parents nowadays, they feel like they got to spend $50,000 a year plus to send their kids to school. I got the money to send my kid to school. My kid's paying for school. <laughs> Well, I think it's. A, I, think I mean, it's we save important... money for her, but she's she she has that bucket of money, and I said, "This is how much money you have to spend for school." Right, and anything over and above that is on you. Yep. So, um, you know, and kind of the way we've seen it is, is whatever the tuition is for that. For I'm not talking about living there. So whatever right. the tuition is that to go to that school, to go to a state school, yeah, um, in our area, which is about fifteen thousand a year. Right. Um, so you get sixty thousand free education and anything over that yeah. is kind of on you so um, and it helps them to think about that and, and what that means and how can they maximize that so um, right it would be a shame for a kid to come out of college and not understand the basic no. fundamentals of money and unfortunately that happens so many times I think our kids know yeah that is bad <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> to listen to us for years. yeah but it's an important thing to think you to teach um, your kids I mean they'll they'll walk out of a uh, a college saddled with two hundred plus thousand dollars worth of debt, so sad. and not, and they don't really understand what that means. Right? right? They don't. So they eventually, they, will pay it off. Yeah, they don't understand what that means. So, right. this is uh, you know, very, very important in my kids, right. in my, in my eyes, anyway. So, so yeah, then you then you fund the college fund, and then after that, it's it's you know it's your time. You know, better right. cars, trips, toys. Those kinds of things, but really, you know, one of the rules that we have here is, is just the total value of all your vehicles, which includes your toys, what we call toys, snowmobiles, boats, motorcycles, those kinds of things should be less than 40% of your annual gross income. And we struggled with this a little bit. Yeah, and, and our clients struggle with this a little bit, right, because essentially, and this is a little bit different, again, it, everybody's situation is different. If you're a, a multimillionaire and you don't make any money but you're all set for the rest of your life, then having whatever car you want is probably fine. But if uh, if you're somebody's, you know, making fifty or a hundred thousand dollars a year, if you're making fifty or a hundred thousand dollars a year, you shouldn't be driving a fifty thousand dollar car. No. Um, Unless it was given to you. Unless it was given to you, and it was free. <laughs> That's right. But even so, that car is extremely expensive to maintain. Me being from an automotive background, a, an $80,000 car is a lot more expensive to, to maintain than a car that cost $30,000 when it was new. Right. Because the parts are just a lot cheaper. So uh, very, very important. So if, you, if your family makes $100,000 a year and you're going to have two cars and a boat, then your two cars and boat, their value really shouldn't be more than forty thousand dollars, which means you could be in maybe two fifteen thousand dollar cars and a ten thousand dollar boat or something. Right. Realistically, like I said, unless you have a significant amount of money put aside, uh, that's all you can afford. Right. That, right. And I struggled with that number. I thought it should be thirty percent. Yeah. Well, just but, just keep in mind too, those things are depreciating assets. And we have been over 40%. We've probably oh, been. I'm sure we have. <laughs> at one time. At one time we had all kinds of things. 
Right. Um, we no longer do. But now we're at like 2%. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> our vehicles are like 2% of our income. Uh, so, yeah. That's okay. So that's how we feel about that. And then, hey, now you're done with all that, and guess what? Now you have money to diversify and conquer. Right, right. And this is where you should start uh, really putting your money to work for you. Yes, in the real in real estate, you know, you can do right again. Everybody's different, right? <laughs> everybody's different, and it's going to appeal. Different things are going to appeal to different people. Right, and, and you know, we should probably do some businesses. Right now, we, we do we do we personally do real estate. Obviously, most of you who know me know I have a lot of money in the stock market. Um, I used to have a lot of money in businesses. We have, we do have. Money in businesses. We do actually, <laughs> yes. As a matter of fact, you're thinking, I am blocking your success. You, you're thinking, but I'm thinking other people's businesses. I'm thinking yes. of other people's businesses right. because my business, I have to work. That's right. <laughs> Somebody else's business, they can work and give me money. That's right. And that's what I putting your money to work in my putting my money to work in my business is just putting me to work. I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I mean, it's okay to work and everything. But. So it's to help other businesses flourish and and profit. So right, from it, so. right. So I could do that and do that. And, and again, if you like that, you know, if you if you don't like the aspect of owning real estate, whether it be uh, you know rental real estate, commercial real estate, then you can do real estate investment trusts in the right. stock market, right? So it's kind of like, hey, I'm a stock market guy, but I don't really want to have all my money in the S and P 500 because you know, you want to be able to diversify it a little bit. You can put some of that in uh, certain real estate companies, uh, rural real estate uh, ETF funds, and um, you can diversify a little bit. I mean, you get a 2008, everything goes down. But normally, normally it's um, normally one goes down, one goes up, or 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 one of them's fairly stable. And then of course, you have bonds too, which we didn't put down here. Bonds would probably be a decent uh, type of a thing to look at. Right. So. So those are and just to diversify. So you want to, right, right. You only don't want so much money uh, per se in a stock market. And you know, people say they want to diversify throughout the stock market, but a lot of times, if one of the stocks goes down, a lot of them are going down. Right, so. <laughs> right, which is unfortunate. But yeah. but it's important to put your money to work for you so that you don't to necessarily work as hard. Right, right. They're little soldiers. You put them out to work, <laughs> and, right. and they, they bring back their prisoners. <laughs> and they give them the to fruits me. of their labor. <laughs> the fruits of their labor. <laughs> that's what we want. To so that's our five phases for tonight. So I hope you enjoyed that. We're going to, uh, we have our slide here, which talks about our free weekly webinars, our blog, and our coaching and so forth. Um, and anytime you have any questions, please feel free to send those questions along to questions at Financial Freedom Classroom. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can also throw them in the box and we'll see if we can catch any in the last couple minutes that we have here. Um, if not, uh, next Thursday, we're going to go over the bull. The bull, one simple trade. There it's you a go. a trade in the stock market that anybody can do. It's an options trade, and it's very, very simple. Um, and you don't even know have, have, you just you know how to you have to know how to use your broker, but you really don't have to know much more than that. There you go. So it'll be kind of cool. So it'll be all John. <laughs> it'll be all John. So um, mostly John. I'm gonna try to learn about the simple trade. Yeah, because 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 uh, Sherry has just. I'm scratching the surface. Yeah, she hasn't uh, <laughs> been along with me on my journey in the stock market. So, <laughs> so I'm going to try the bowl. So, so um, we want to thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. And we hope to talk with you and with all next week. Good night. Good night.